Thank you, Paul. Recognizing uh, the signs of the times, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues, distinguished guests, one of the fundamental uh, dimensions of Christianity is its prophetic role. Uh, we affirm that Christ entrusted uh, his church to continue his prophetic mission. An important component of the prophetic mission is reading the signs of the times. The art of interpreting current events as God speaking to us, as God's continuing self-communication. Throughout the history of the church, that interpretation has not only taken the form of preaching and theological writings, it has also manifested itself in the lives of charismatic individuals, veneration of the saints. Uh, is the church's recognition of their life stories as the means whereby God has a say in history through them and answered the important needs of the church at a specific time. The tragic features of the lives of those great witnesses to the faith, particularly their persecution, not only at the hand of uh, Christianity's enemies, but often of the church itself, are evidence that the prophetic mission entails many risks and a cross. Uh, these are not only a risk of a prophetic mission, however. It is clear that in a few areas of its activity is the church uh, so powerfully exposed to the risk of error, to the temptation of perceiving its own fears and desires as word of God and of proclaiming human, all to human, fantasies, ideologies, and interests of worldly power as having divine authority. The endeavor to read the signs of the times with theological responsibility is a very difficult task of interpretation because God does not have a direct voice in history. What represented the revolutionary turning point of modernity was the understanding the importance of history as the ever-changing context of everything that makes up our world. The emphasis of temporality and the historical dimension of all reality the discovery of history as an all-encompassing process of constant change altered the approach, the approach to what had previously been perceived statically. Charles Darwin turned biology into history. The theory of evolution perceives nature as a dynamic drama, as an event in time, in place of unchanging human nature, Heidegger, posits human existence as being in time. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the emphasis of history also established itself in theology. Modern theology perceived the Bible as testimony to God's self-revelation in the history of salvation, <clears throat> as a testimony that must be understood in historical and cultural context. If we are to grasp the meaning of any phenomenon, we need to know the context. God is the ultimate context of human history. Human history <clears throat> and the stories of individual people that form part of it are fragments but God is not available as an all-embracing context. God is revered, but yet remains an inexhaustible mystery. God dwells in unapproachable light. 
And here we see God in a mirror, only dimly as St. Paul wrote. We relate to God with patience of faith, hope, and love. We must therefore be very circumspect when attempting to interpret current events as a part of God's communication with mankind, it must show eschatological patience and self-critical humility. If political theology is to be an authentic component of prophetic interpretation of the present, it must not become a political ideology. It should rather be critical of ideologies and protect itself all the time against contamination by ideologies and power interest, as well as institutional interest of the church. In some of my books, I have tried to give an idea of what negative eschatology uh, consists. It is an application of the principle of apophatic theology in the sphere of political theology. Negative eschatology means rejecting not only naive popular fantasies about the specific form of the life after death, but also secular eschatologies and political eschatologies that promise earthly paradise. We from the Eastern and Central Europe know that many ideologies promise the earth uh, the paradise on earth turn earth into hell. Negative es eschatology is also rejection of ecclesiastical triumphalism, which, con uh, which confuse the historical conditioned form of the church on earth, ecclesia militans, with the spotless pride of the lamp of the lamp's eschatological marriage the celestial ecclesia triumphans. I have tried to demonstrate the ecclesiastical triumphalism, the inability to differentiate eschatologically between the ecclesia militans on earth and the ecclesia triumphans. This, uh, this mixture leads to militant religion. It is necessary to abandon the triumphalist concept of the church as an arrogant possessor of the truth. Instead, we must develop the image of the church as a communio viatorum, as God's people on a journey through history. This is the eschatology of Vatican II. Uh, the church is the servant of the truth. We stand on the path of truth insofar as we follow Christ. But we are on journey, not at the, des at the destination. On our journey through history towards our eschatological goal, we need to dialogue with others. We are all pilgrims, and we should not ignore others experiences. Attempts at spiritual diagnosis of the times, a theological interpretation of the signs of the times, require dialogue and also a dialogue of theology with the social sciences, particularly sociology. There are two topics in contemporary sociology of religion that are important both for the theological reflection on society and the church's pastoral practice. I refer to the new attitude to the phenomenon of secularization and the growth of a gray era between believers and atheists. In fact, it is not gray era, it's a very, very colorful area between uh, the believers and the atheists. Uh, secularization has long ceased to be perceived as an irreversible process that started in Europe on the threshold of modernity and will sooner or later pervade the entire history of religion and determine 
the future shape of the world. I'm convinced that secular humanism is more likely an unwanted child of traditional Christianity. The secular humanism of enlightenment was a fruit of efforts by European intellectuals who were frustrated by mutual religious quarrels and wars between Catholic and Protestant to find a sad way for Christianity. One might speak about one of many recontextualizations of Christian faith. Secularization does not mean the end of Christianity, but rather the absorption of many fundamental elements of Christianity into the context of modern society. This absorption can be described as a success on, his, on its part, but that success has been offset by a loss of visibility. But that paradox only reveals the fundamental paradox of Christianity that is inherent in the very canotic character of the gospel. Pope John Paul II proclaimed the necessity of a new evangelization of a secular society. The difficulties involved in contemporary attempts in culturation Christianity because uh, evangelization without inculturation is just indoctrination. And especially in the post-communist world, we are allergic to any indoctrination. So if there will be uh, evangelization, it must be inculturation, the incarnation of the values of the Christian faith into the context of living, living culture. Uh, way of thinking people, way of life of people. Um, so, uh, the difficulties involved in contemporary attempts in culturating Christian in modern society, society with Christian roots, were highlighted by Charles Taylor in his lecture, A Catholic Modernity. So we are all quoted Charles Taylor, and uh, uh, father of the church of contemporary <laughs> of our time. <laughs> um, there will never be a complete and trouble-free symbiosis of Christianity and modernity. It has always been dynamic and dramatic in nature and will continue to be. Nonetheless, I agree with the conclusion reached in the well-known dialogue between Cardinal Ratzinger and Junker Habermas in Munich, uh, 2004, namely that Christian faith and secular humanism need each other as a mutual corrective to their one-sidedness. A Christianity that thoughts to turn it, its back on the legacy of enlightenment rationality would end up in the quomire of fundamentalism and conversely a secularism that sought to tear itself away from its Christian roots and spiritual and ethical richness of the Christian tradition could end up as a barren pragmatism and political cynicism. In certain cases, laicite, there is also the healthy laicity, uh, Pope Benedict spoke about, but in certain cases, laicite itself can turn into an intolerant pseudo-religion. Jose Casanova, another father of the church, of <laughs> um, has indicated the need to distinguish between secularization, secularity, and secularism. Of great importance is his assertion that, I quote, only the recognition that we live in a secular age can open space for a post-secular consequent consciousness that begin to recognize secularity not as a higher state after religion, 
but as an anthropological condition of openness to all kinds of religious and secular options. End of the quotation. In our times, when contact between Islam and Western civilization is assuming new forms, and there is a threat of dramatic confrontation, the Catholic Church could play a role similar to one it played at the time of mass migration and the collapse of the Roman Empire when it passed it on to the barbarians, not only the Catholic faith, but also the cultural heritage of antiquity together with Hellenistic philosophy and Roman law. The Catholic Church would now seem to be the only force capable in certain circumstances of being mediator of some kind between Islam and the secular culture of the West, since it shares many common values with both camps. I think that uh, really the Catholic Church is the only institution which can reach the hands of both sides. We have much in common with the, with the Islam and Ponotheism, but we have also much in common with the secular world which uh, appeared from the womb of, uh, of, 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 of Christianity. So it is a challenge to uh, do some, uh, some understanding between these two, two worlds. Uh, another important topic uh, in the contemporary sociology of religion is the discovery that the chief division nowadays is not between believers and non-believers, but between dwellers and seekers. I regard that uh, distinction as the most momentous feature of the spiritual situation of our times, and, the con and I'm convinced that it will be of crucial importance on our reflections on the church future role and tasks. The assertion heard from many quarters that the number of believers in our part of the world is on the decline is based on the assumption that by believers is meant dwellers, namely people they have a home in the church as it has existed here uh, for, who are entirely identified with the existing institutional form of the church, with its liturgical practice and manner of preaching and so on. Yes, the number of such people is declining, and the same is true of the number of dwellers in the atheist camp, of those who are totally at home in the old and new dogmas of atheism. However, both among those who consider themselves believers and those who consider themselves non-believers, the numbers of seekers is growing. All the time, there are more and more believers who regard their faith as a journey, as a dynamic process that also involves crisis and periods of uncertainty, as well as new experiences that oblige them to re reappear many old attitudes and options. In many countries, in addition to regular churchgoers, there are a great number of those who have not abandoned their faith but identified only marginally with the church, the lapsed Catholics, or uh, have seized it, identified at all with one. Grace Davy uh, termed this phenomenon believing without belonging. And there is also belonging without believing, as we all know. Uh, many of our contemporaries are simul fidelis et infidelis. The contradiction between belief and non-belief is no longer between two distinct and separated groups, like between two uh, ice hockey teams, but often manifests itself within the minds and hearts of many individuals. But uh, even among the unbelievers, there are increasing number of those who are by no means 
tone deaf regarding religion and spirituality. Their critic and rejection of organized religion is often directed at a caricature of faith and caricature of God which they have created themselves or adapted or which they have come across in their community. Sometimes I ask the unbelievers, so what is your image of the God uh, in which you don't believe? And if he uh, said me something about his image of God, I must say thanks to God that you don't believe in such a God. In such a God, I don't believe either. But then he said, oh, uh, I, I don't believe in, 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 in the God which is, yes. <laughs> uh, my friend, you know. <laughs> uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, I don't believe in, in, in a God uh, uh, who, is, uh, uh, who is criticized by, 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 by Richard Davy, uh, by, by Richard Dawkins. Um, and then he said, oh, but I'm not a, a stupid materialist. You know, I know something is above us. I say this somethingness is the most widespread religion in, in our country, perhaps not in our country, something must be. But this something, it is a challenge for the theologian to have the hermeneutics of this something and somethingness. So, um, the space between dwellers on both sides, tradition believers on the one hand, and the resolute atheists by the other, is fertile ground of spiritual experiments and new forms. But as well as seekers, there is also a fairly considerable percentage of people who are apathetic concerning religion or spirituality. One might refer to them as apatheists rather than atheists. In my view, the church service for seekers is distinct from the two main classical forms of pastoral activity from the care of souls of all the functions, institutions, most frequently parishes, and from missionary activity aims at bringing new sheep into existing fold. The third way is the spiritual accompanied, accompaniment. The aim of accompaniment is not to bring lost sheep back. Seekers cannot be approached from a position of possessor of the truth. Accompaniment involves partnership, dialogue, solidarity, and mutual respect. Accompaniment requires generosity. In some makes you go one mile with them, go two miles. Accompaniment also calls for the courage to leave one's familiar territory and grant the person we are accompanying the freedom to choose their own direction and goal. Even it means that one's past subsequently diverge at some point. Dialogue implies the possibility that the attitude of both partners might change and the risk should be viewed as an opportunity. It is not a matter of bringing the accompanied person to where we are at home. Uh, as we know it, but rather to marvel on the way like Solomon and so on. Uh, the words of the Orthodox theologian Evdokimov are inspirational in this respect. We know where the church is, but we don't know where the church isn't. The practice of accompaniment requires a new theological understanding of the church, new ecclesiology. Uh, Pope Benedict invited seekers into church entrance hall, where, like the Jews in the temple of Jerusalem, we should maintain a courtyard of the Gentiles. Maybe we need to go farther. Pope Francis reversed the gospel image about the Lord knocking on the door. Christ is knocking on the door from inside. He wants to get out of the confines of the church. God in Christ wants to meet Jesus on the road to a mouse as a foreigner and stranger. The French theologian Joseph Moynt, invoking uh, Jesus' words it's better for you that I go, 
urges us to let God go. Uh, that is to say, let him go to others. Let us discover that he is not simply the God of our fathers, our inherited property, but also the God of others. Precisely because he is one of the universe, he is one universal God, he is not a God on which we could have monopoly. Moin's position is a radical emulation of St. Paul. The apostle presents Christianity to us as a face capable of dissociating itself with the past, ridding itself of old customs and certainties, rejecting particularity and going to others. Paul presents Christianity to us as a new politia, as a new way of communication between people and between societies. Paul's crossing of the borders of Israel and setting out for the peoples, the pagans, should be a paradigm for the entire history of the church. But when we look at the history, we get a different picture. The church quickly withdrew into a new particularism of its own. The notion of a new Israel did not engender the courage to be constantly people on the way, boldly crossing all borders. Instead, we tended to become a second Israel, and as a particular community, alongside Israel, rather than a truly new Israel, that would take up the dynamic aspect of the chosen people's face, Abraham, departure from his homeland, and the exodus, the departure from Egypt, above all, Paul's crossing from the frontiers of the Mosaic law in search of all human beings without any difference. The church became more a new particle group among others. It started to guard its frontiers and turn uh, its face into a heritage of the fathers, inherited property. And uh, yet the church should Pentecostalists speak all languages and not presuppose that our Christianity is the language whereby God speaks to all and that everyone is required to understand it. It is we who must try to understand others only in what we, uh, on, on, uh, uh, only in that way can we try to address others intelligibly. Our God is also the God of others, including seekers and those who don't know him. Yes, God is above all the God of seekers, of people on journey. If we profess God of Abraham, we prove our faithfulness not by clinging to a specific tradition of the past, like Abraham, by entering new territory. Our God is a pilgrim God the God of eternal exodus, who leads us out of the homes and homelands, even those we would prefer to settle in them. Our openness toward, toward others is our openness toward God. Because through Christ, God shows solidarity with others. God seeks to be present in the world through our testimony of love. God is present in the world also through our seeking. The eye by which we see God and the eye by which God sees us is the self-same eye, uh, Master Eckhart maintained. I think the God seeking us and our seeking God is the self-same seeking. God is present in the inquietude, iniquitas, iniquitatis of our hearts. If the church is to fulfill its prophetic mission and learn to read the signs of the times, if it is to be a discerning church, it must be a serving church and welcoming church. It must learn to recognize Christ in the seekers and in its own seeking. Thank you.